everyone, good to see you this week. Uh, thank you for joining me. I am really excited to do this video. It was inspired by all the interviews that I've been doing lately with other people. And it got me thinking that I actually don't have my story, my own story in any one place on this channel, just all together neatly at once. So inspired by these interviews that I've been doing lately, I have decided that I am going to interview myself and share with you my 10 year journey of living with and fully recovering from chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalomyelitis. But just before I dive in, as always, it's important for people watching to know that I am not a healthcare professional of any kind. I am simply sharing my own experience and nothing of what I share should be considered medical advice. What a great question, and thank you for that, Raylan. Clearly I wrote all the questions. But I thought, why not start off with something that I haven't shared in any of my other videos, and that is that I actually have a much longer history with chronic fatigue syndrome, or ME-CFS, than I typically speak about, or at least my family does. It goes back three generations, as far as I know, and I was acutely aware of this illness before I ever got sick with it. My mother actually got very sick in her early 30s and went through a very similar story like the rest of us, seeing many doctors, couldn't figure out what was wrong. It took a long time, but eventually she came around to the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. This all started when I was about five years old and went on for the rest of her life. And it, for her, she eventually had to quit her job, uh, quit everything by the end. She was housebound, often bedbound, and when she did leave the house, she had to do so in a wheelchair. It got very bad. It was extremely stressful for my father, myself, and of course, for my mother, I, which is one of the reasons I don't talk about it much. We had many incredibly difficult years that I actually don't even know how to sum up into words properly. She was extremely isolated, severely depressed, and became very hopeless in the end. She had tried a zillion different things to get better, seen countless doctors, and just nothing was working. And she just kept getting worse and worse and worse to the point where she could barely do anything. Um, it couldn't make her own food anymore. We had to do uh, a lot of things to take care of her. Uh, and in the end, she actually ended up taking her own life. She... She just had a really low quality of life and the depression set in hard and she was feeling very hopeless. So it's very sad for me to talk about and I don't bring it up much. But I do think it's important because we are starting to understand more and more that at least for some of us, it appears that there may be a genetic component to this illness and her mother actually had similar health problems as well. And it started around the same time in her life, in her early 30s. For her, it eventually did ease up and got to a point where she was functional, a sort of functional recovery, though never great. Uh, but so my mother's mother did have the same history of illness as well. So we have three generations of ME-CFS in my family, as far as we can tell. Which made, when I got sick with it, all the more difficult because I knew all too well, what a nightmare this illness was. So before I got sick, this was when I was in my 20s and I was always on the go. I'd have one or two jobs. I was going to school part-time or full-time. I was very social and very active, I, especially towards my late 20s. I started working out a lot. I became obsessed with the gym. I was working out up up to seven days a week and up to three hours a day. It was not uncommon for me to go to the gym twice in one day. I'd sometimes work out in the morning before work and then go again in the evening. I traveled a lot. Uh, my husband and I, now ex-husband, bit of a spoiler there, but we loved to travel as much as we could manage. I just, I don't remember sitting still. I partied a lot with my friends. I was out shopping, just doing, always doing something, always doing something. I looked at my mother and I, I looked at the life that she had and I was determined that that was never going to happen to me. I, you know, even though my mother and my grandmother had had very similar illnesses, for whatever reason, um, mostly denial, I think, I chose to believe that it wasn't going to happen to me. Uh, if I just kept moving, kept really busy, kept really active, uh, I would be fine. 
I really a thousand percent was sure that this was not at all in my future. For me, it was 2008 and my mother had just passed away in the last year and I had just turned 30 years old. It came on really fast for me, as I know it does for a lot of people. It felt like virtually overnight, my life went from being this crazy, busy, active, you know, social, normal life to what felt like a living hell. I'd just gotten back from back-to-back -back vacations. I'd been traveling for about six weeks and I was completely exhausted and I got a really bad flu. And I took some time off work, I went back to work, and then I got sick again. Now, here's something that I haven't mentioned before anywhere. I don't bring this up because I'm not sure how it sounds, but I feel like it's at least noteworthy. So. I got back from those vacations, exhausted, depleted, got the flu, was laid out for a full week, and then I went back to work, and for a couple days I was feeling a bit better. Not great, but better. And I was working in a hospital as a social worker, and they were giving out uh, flu shots to all the staff. So I went and I got a flu shot, and that night I got incredibly sick again. Really sick. It was like that flu had just come back full blown, and I essentially stayed sick for about 10 years from then. So I'm not saying the flu shot caused the illness and I don't certainly want to sound anti-vax and uh, I wouldn't want to discourage people from getting flu shots and vaccinations because I know how incredibly valuable they are. It just seems like something that's maybe at least worth mentioning. So take from that what you will. It felt in the beginning especially very much just like I had a flu that just wouldn't go away. I had belts of nausea that just came and went, these waves that would come over me that were just intense. I had headaches, I had weakness in my body, I had extreme debilitating fatigue that was not made better by rest. Body aches, sore throats, sore lymph nodes, brain fog and memory issues. I had digestive issues, problems with my gut, and Basically every single mental or physical activity that I did left me feeling worse. I was just laid out. I was just really sick and barely able to function. It was really crazy and I know that it's something that I suspect a lot of you watching can relate to, but it's just like having the rug pulled out from under you. Like I went from this super active, busy person to, I, I remember my mailbox was at the end of my street. Not a long street, just a regular, regular old block. And I'd say six out of seven days, getting to the end of the street to get the mail was impossible. Like that mailbox might as well have been on the moon for all that mattered because there was just no way I could get to it most of the time. And just how shocking it is to go from that one way of living to this other way where you just aren't functioning at, functioning at all. I felt like a kidnapping victim. I really felt like my life, someone had just come and stolen it from me. And for about the first year, I was mostly just in bed. I could do very little. Fortunately, I could still read sometimes and that really helped, really helped to keep me sane. And I could still do basic self-care things. I could make myself, you know, basic food and, and whatnot. But other than that, I was in bed. I was reading, and when I wasn't up to reading, I was watching TV. I watched so much TV. I remember watching The Big Bang Theory from start to finish, all the seasons, and then starting it at the beginning and watching them all over again. The characters on TV shows became like my friends because it was my whole world. My husband worked out of town a lot. I was by myself a lot, and it is really strange, but these fictional characters became like my people. They became my world. I've actually done a whole video where I just talk about what that first year or two was like. So if you're interested in hearing more, I'll put a link in this video's description. And any videos that I mention in this video, just know that they're all in the video description if you're interested in checking them out. Oh, I bet you can guess how this one goes. I went to see my family doctor who I'd been seeing for years, a doctor that I actually really liked. And I explained to her as best as I could what had been happening. She ran some tests, they came back normal, I came back again, she ran some more tests, they came back normal. And I just kept coming back because I was really sick, I couldn't even go to work, I couldn't do anything. And But she just couldn't find anything. So eventually I said to her, I need your help 
until we figure this out because I can't go to work and I can't, I've run out of sick time. I was taking time off without pay. I just, someone had suggested, had told me that there was an option if I had got the paperwork from my doctor that I could take a short-term disability leave from work. So I was wondering if you could help me out with that paperwork so I could have some time until we figure this out so that I don't lose my job. And, you know, I talked about this in that first video. It really devastated me, her response, because she didn't believe me. Uh, she looked to me like I was, my request was just so ridiculous and so insane. Like, how could I be asking her this? And she straight up said, there's nothing wrong with you. You know, how am I supposed to fill out paperwork when there's, there's nothing wrong with you? So it was crushing. It was really tough. She was the person at that time. I, I realize now how this cannot at all be your attitude. But at that time, she, it was her responsibility to get me out of this. It was 100% her that was going to figure out what the problem was. So when she wasn't even willing to help me, it was really scary. So eventually I found a doctor who practiced integrative medicine. So a combination of Western and alternative healthcare approaches. And he was actually really great. So, I mean, in the end, he didn't have end up Despite his best efforts, he didn't end up having a lot of answers for me. And he was very expensive because he was a private doctor. And I didn't even know, because I'm from Canada, that our healthcare system had the option for private doctors because we have a universal healthcare system that covers everything, I thought. Uh, but it was coming short, coming up short for me. So I found this private doctor and I started paying for him out of pocket. And it was insanely expensive. But he worked very hard and he was very committed and he believed me. And he filled out the paperwork I needed to take a leave from work. So that relieved a huge amount of stress for me. And I was able to go on a disability leave and maintain a portion of my pay. I was spending thousands of dollars per month seeing this doctor and paying for treatments and trying different things. And I spent all the money that my husband and I had and were making plus more. We were going into debt fast. I was desperate. And I know now that I was fortunate that I was able to do that. Definitely appreciate that not everyone has money to spend on treatments. Not everyone even has access to credit like I did. So it allowed me to try a lot of different things. It also allowed me to go into a ton of debt, but at least I had that option. I had the option of trying things and most of it didn't work, but I can't imagine how scary and frustrating it would be to not even be able to try some of these things. This doctor eventually diagnosed me with ME-CFS. It was for me, I was acutely aware of what this illness was and the absolute worst diagnosis I could think of on the planet. I'm not saying that objectively it is, the worst diagnosis. I'm just saying that for me at that time, I would have taken anything else. Anything. That first year I was reduced to about 20% functionality, I'd say, with my crashes and really bad times taking me down probably to about 10%. So I'd say in that first year, I was in that moderate range and from there I progressed over the years to what would be considered mild ME-CFS. And just a quick thought, something else I've also been hesitant to bring up in videos because I'm not sure what people will think, but as much as I dislike the name chronic fatigue syndrome, and I think virtually all of us are on board with that one, it is a crappy name. The introduction of the qualifiers of mild, moderate, uh, severe, extremely severe are newer to me. They didn't exist to my knowledge when my mom had this illness or even, I'm not sure when I first got sick. And I think it's important because we need to talk about the spectrum that this illness exists on because it definitely is a spectrum. But to call something mild chronic fatigue syndrome sounds like something that everybody on the planet has. Whereas mild chronic fatigue syndrome for most of us is still a condition that the average healthy person would consider severely debilitating. So I'm just throwing this out there. Food for thought. You know, maybe we could come up with something else. Maybe it could be like phase one, two, three, four. Just something that doesn't sound so invalidating and lacking credibility as mild chronic fatigue syndrome. Because in my experience, mild chronic fatigue syndrome could still be absolutely devastating. So after seeing what my mom went through, I was determined to get well. So I 
the biggest thing for me was to try and research. So I was reading books by the dozens. I was averaging about four books per week, most of those being health related and not just chronic fatigue syndrome. They could be about just generally things about health or healing from cancer or just about diet, holistic medicine, anything, anything I could get my hands on that I thought might be able to help. If it sounded at all like it had potential or if even one person on the planet had had success with it, I was willing to try it. Something else that added to the, the cost of all this is that my doctor did I felt like every lab test under the sun. So I, again, I was in Canada. Uh, it, we're not really set up this way. So he had to use American labs. So we were sending every bodily fluid I had over to the States to these various, very expensive labs to get these different workups to get a better sense of what was going on in my body. And those tests revealed all sorts of things. I had hormonal imbalances. I had leaky gut syndrome. I had Epstein-Barr virus human herpes virus 6, I think that's what it's called, HHV6. I had uh, chronic Lyme disease, hypoglycemia. I'm probably forgetting some. I seriously had a four inch ring binder that I filled with test results. It was crazy the amount of testing that I got done and all sorts of stuff showed up. It was popping up all over. I was apparently a mess. <laughs> For those first two years, although I did a lot of different things, it was primarily the biggest one was supplements and insane amount of supplements. I was spending somewhere around two to three thousand dollars per month just on supplements alone. I was taking about a hundred pills per day spaced out throughout the day, plus different, you know, injections and powders and drinks and potions and but just pills alone, it was averaging somewhere around 100 pills a day in supplements. Another part of my treatment at that time was just essentially cleaning up my life. So cutting out sugar, alcohol, caffeine, processed foods, removing toxins from my environment. My doctor felt that a meat based diet would be very important for me at that time. So he strongly encouraged me to eat a lot of animal-based protein. He literally said, have steak for breakfast. So I did. I started eating steak for breakfast. I played around with different diets, you know, throughout my time being sick, even a bit in those first couple years. But for the most part, I followed what he said to the letter. I had a lot of respect for him. And at that time, I wasn't really thinking for myself in terms of my recovery. I just did what he told me to do. So if he thought I needed steak for breakfast, um, that's pretty much what I did. I did months worth of heavy doses of antibiotics to try and address the chronic Lyme disease. Uh, antibiotics that made me so sick, so incredibly sick. Uh, I did prescription antivirals to try and address you know, Epstein-Barr and all the different things in my body that had popped up on the, the test results. I was doing B12 injections, hormone replacement therapy. I bought and installed an infrared sauna and put it in my basement. I installed a water filtration system into my home. I got my mouth checked for any kind of problematic fillings or anything that could be causing problems. I was doing things like oil swishing and tongue scraping and I started working on my light exposure and um, vitamin D. I, I'd spend time outside in the summer on my deck when I could and then I bought one of those light therapy boxes that I'd sit in front of inside my home in the winter. I switched all my body products and home products to non-toxic versions. Every bite of food that I put into my mouth is organic. I drank lemon water in the morning and wheatgrass juice in the morning when I could manage it and I also drank coconut oil. I must have read that somewhere that it was good for you and I smeared it all over my body. Apparently coconut oil was going to heal everything so I just tried to get it in everywhere that I could. Always smelled like coconut. I did elimination diets, trying to figure out if there were any culprits in my diet that were making me sick and at this point virtually everything I ate made me feel worse. I had somehow, it seemed like overnight, developed all these food intolerances and there was just nothing nothing that I could eat. Everything made me feel sick. And I did every cleanse that I ever read about in any of the books that I bought. All these sorts of wonky cleanses. I, I did them all. I counted how much I chewed my food. I was measuring my pH levels. I was doing deep breathing exercises to try and oxygenate myself properly. I'd heard about people who had healed themselves through laughter. So laugh therapy was something I kept reading about. So I was watching funny TV shows and just doing everything I could to get myself to laugh. I consumed things like bee pollen and bentonite clay and every superfood powder 
that exists out there that someone might happen to recommend. It was just nuts. It was really crazy. I really was just so desperate and whatever spare energy I had, I was putting into trying things. And in addition to this integrative medicine doctor, I also, also saw a whole bunch of other therapists, again, when I could manage it. And this was spread over the course of about two years. So it's not like this was all at once. But I saw colon hydrotherapists, massage therapists, Reiki therapists. I went for acupuncture, physiotherapy, chiropractors. I went to homeo homeopathic doctors and tried homeopathic medicine. I went to naturopathic doctors who I believe just gave me more supplements. I did something called family constellation therapy. I was going to psychiatrists who wanted to put me on all sorts of meds, which I did not take. I was going to counselors and psychologists for counseling. I got allergy testing done. I even consulted someone for Ayurvedic medicine and treatment. So I really just, I mean, my mind was wide open when it came to considering things. I really just, I really was willing to try anything. One thing I didn't try in those first couple of years was any kind of exercise. I tried probably in the first few months doing little bits, but it was just terrible. I crashed and burned so hard. It always made me worse, so much worse to the point where I got really scared of exercise. So it wasn't a part of my program at all. So basically, for the most part, I just laid in bed. So that first full year of doing all of this, I saw zero improvement despite all the money that I was spending and all the supplements that I was taking and all the different therapies. I, it seemed that nothing was helping and I became severely depressed. It was just like being trapped in this prison of suffering and after seeing what my mother had gone through and how for her it just got worse and worse and worse, I had a very clear picture in my mind, I thought anyways, it was an inaccurate one, but it was a clear one of where my life was going and when nothing was working, I just, I always vowed that I wouldn't live a life like hers. Um, I saw the hell that she went through and I knew that this was not something that I wanted for myself, not something I was willing to go through. So when nothing was working, I myself did get really hopeless and did have thoughts of taking my life. I like to as much as possible keep things light and upbeat and inspiring. I certainly don't want to dwell on the negative, but I also think it's important to occasionally talk about the hells and the horrors that come with this illness. And I know that I'm not alone in reaching these depths of hopelessness and despair and depression. So if you or anyone you know is ever feeling this low, please get help. There is help there. I will put some links in this video description for people that you can reach out to because it's really important to talk to someone. Because for me, I know how tragic it would be if I had given up and all that I would have missed out on my life. Uh, really just so many amazing things were to come. I, I just didn't know that then. And then the second year I did start to improve a bit. So if I was at 20% functionality before, I'd say by the end of the second year, I was at about 40% functionality. Because I did so many things at once, it's really hard to really know what was helping and what wasn't. And in that second year, I'd sometimes still feel intensely bad and be brought back down to that 20 or 10%. And I imagine other people find this as well. I wouldn't even know if I was actually getting worse or if it was actually a good sign because it meant something I had tried was working. You know, I was told, oh, it's a, you're Herxing. It's a Herxheimer reaction or a die-off reaction. It just means that what you're doing is working. So I became conditioned to associate feeling worse with getting better, which was a bit bizarre. Uh, and a bit of a weird thing to navigate because sometimes some things might make you feel worse just because they're not helping. They're actually making you worse, but I really didn't know. So I kind of plateaued though around that 40% functionality that I regained. I couldn't seem to get past it, but I could do more things. You know, I could, most days I could managed to go and reach my mailbox at the end of my block. I even started mowing my own lawn. I had to do it over three days though. So I'd do a third of it and then rest till the next day, do another third, rest, and then the third day I'd finish it off, but I could do it. My neighbors must have thought I was nuts, really wondered what my lawn mowing strategy was, but that was the only way I could manage it. I was feeling good enough that I felt that I could manage. I'd watched a documentary about this rejuvenation center in Arizona 
that a lot of people were going to and apparently healing from all sorts of illnesses, predominantly through a raw vegan diet and juice fasting and then some other therapies and detox stuff. So I actually booked myself a ticket and I went and I stayed there for a month and it cost me about $10,000. It was quite expensive. The debt was just building and building. And I actually did a video just all about my experience at this detox center. If you're interested in hearing about it, it was a really wild, wild experience. So if you want to check out the video, I'll put the link below. So at about that two year mark, I started feeling huge pressure for my insurance company to go back to work because I was still receiving 60%, I believe, of my income through the insurance company. And they made me jump through all sorts of hoops. It was exhausting. They were forever sending me to new doctors, rejecting paperwork I'd put in, making me do all sorts of new tests. It, they would just suddenly cut me off. I would just one day realize I no longer had it and I'd have to go see a bunch more doctors to get it back again. It was really tiring, uh, but I was feeling the pressure to go back. So they put me on a gradual return to work schedule. I was feeling a little tiny bit better, delusional, thinking that I could go back to work in any capacity, but uh, denial is a big theme of my time spent with the illness. I had my head in the sand a lot. <laughs> so they designed this or they came up with this schedule for me that I was supposed to start out going to work for four hours, uh, three days a week. So really nothing too intense, but I only lasted maybe two weeks and I had to quit. I, even just going for four hours a day, I would lock the door to my office and I would take naps on top of my desk because I was just exhausted. Those four hours, it was like an ultra marathon for me to get through. So after a couple weeks and it was making me sicker and sicker and it was getting harder and harder, I just came to finally realize that I couldn't see myself going back to work if in the foreseeable future. So I just quit. Oh, illness can be hard on relationships, can't it? Illness can be impossibly hard on relationships and many people make it through it and thrive. I'm not saying it can't be done, but for my relationship, it was the end of us. So once I was feeling just a little bit better and we could take the focus off my illness, you know, a little bit after that first couple of years, it was just enough for, you know, me to put my head up, or both of us, my ex-husband and I to put our heads up and have a real conversation about this. We tried going to therapy and, but it was just, it was too late and we were done. So it was heartbreaking for me. It was, to me, it was like experiencing a death of someone close to me. It really ripped me apart, my marriage ending. Uh, but I also knew it was the right thing. I think we both knew it was the right thing. So we promptly sold our beautiful house and a good thing that came out of that is that it we were just Canada was in a housing boom so it paid off all our debt and we each got to walk away with some money and I moved back home into my childhood home with my father. I was so grateful to my father and I knew I was fortunate to have this wonderful place to go when my whole life seemed to be falling apart. But even knowing how lucky I was to have that, how fortunate I was, it didn't seem to help at all with my depression and my hopelessness about my life. I mean, I had just, in the span of about three years, lost my mother, gotten severely sick, quit my job, got divorced, and then moved back in with my dad in my childhood home. It, it really just felt like my life was in the toilet. And I tried everything that I knew of to get better and I seemed to be stuck. I didn't know how to get past where I was. It kind of seemed like this is as good as it's gonna get. And I can't go back to work, even part-time. I can't support myself. So yeah, I was feeling really hopeless. I was feeling really low. I knew I had to do something drastic. I just, it felt like an early midlife crisis of sorts. Like I just really, really had to do something crazy to get myself to want to keep going. And I had all that, <laughs> had some money in the bank from the sale of the house. So it felt like that was my hope. Like, what can I do with that money to turn it into something that will make me excited about living again? So I'd always love to travel. I'd always love seeing the world. And it was the only thing I could think of that got me excited. And I was still really sick. I didn't know how I was going to manage it, but I just decided I was going to go somewhere. I was just going to book myself a ticket and just 
go. And then I would crawl around on my hands and knees if I had to once I got there. You know, even if I was in bed most of the time, that was okay. At least I was in a different bed in a different part of the world. So I just booked myself a ticket. I'm usually a big planner, but I didn't put a lot of thought into this. I ended up booking myself a ticket to Bangkok, Thailand, and I packed myself a backpack, put all my stuff in storage, and quite quickly I just went. The trip was only supposed to be for six months, that was the plan, and I actually ended up staying for eight and a half years. I don't know how I did it, I truly don't. I rested a lot. If you look at the pictures from that time, they are deceiving because it looks like I'm always on the go and super energetic, but there was a lot of downtime, a lot of time spent in bed. I only planned things in short spurts, did little outings, but as time progressed, you know, as the years progressed, I could do a little bit more and a little bit more. And I've done a video all about this, that first year of backpacking, what that was like. So again, if you want to check it out, check the video description for that link. And it's amazing. I came to appreciate how much happiness and joy plays into our experience of health and recovery. Because whereas I couldn't manage four hours of work, I could manage four hours of something that was bringing me joy. Because without that stress, my body was capable of so much more. So the joy and the happiness that I experienced while gone really helped me a lot. And it's also a time where I came to appreciate how pushing my body little bits here and there was making me stronger. So I started to see the potential for things like movement and exercise to play into my recovery process. Of course, I needed to find a way eventually to make money. I spent all the money that I had and then went into debt again significant debt. I did not learn my lesson the first time, but being overseas and living this life was like a drug for me. I just didn't want it to end. I didn't care about the debt at all. You know, I tried doing different things for work. And again, I've done videos about that as well. I tried being a scuba diving instructor, a teacher, some things that really just pretty much failed spectacularly. And I had some pretty bad health crashes as a result of some of the jobs that I tried to do. Health crashes that took my health back at times, back to 20%, sometimes even back to 10%. And where again, my state of mind, my depression, my hopelessness would come back on really hard and I'd really struggle. But then as I'd start to feel better and the crash or that relapse would pass, uh, you know, my mental state would pick up again and my happiness and joy would come back. Eventually I found a job in Malaysia that allowed me to work mostly from home, so that helped. It was still incredibly difficult, but it, it allowed me to get by, so it kept me afloat financially. And I had a lot of great times over those years, some of the best of my life. And I also used caffeine a lot to fuel me through the day, which I know now is really, really not good for my recovery. And I also used alcohol a lot, which is another thing that I don't talk that much about in my videos. During that time in my life, I relied on alcohol a lot. I drank to excess on the regular, because when I was drinking at that point, Earlier in my illness, I definitely had alcohol intolerance. I, I couldn't manage it at all. But later on, once I was in that more mild state, uh, it was something that could give me energy. It was something that could be my fuel for my social life and I could feel like a normal person almost. Of course, there would be hell to pay and I would have hangovers that would last for days. You know, it hit me really, really hard. But in the moment, I could just be like a normal, social, happy person like everyone around me. I eventually got to a point where I knew I couldn't keep going like this. I really was hanging on by a thread. I was you know, getting through life by the seat of my pants. I throw as many mixed metaphors at you as I can. <laughs> I was white knuckling it, skin of my teeth, ah, but it was hard. Jokes aside, it was really hard. Every single day of my life felt like a struggle. I needed naps every day. I could never figure out how I was going to get through all these different activities I had to do. I was barely scraping by financially. I was in a lot of debt. It was just life was really hard and I was tired of feeling sick all the time and I realized that this wasn't sustainable. I couldn't keep going like this. But actually met my then boyfriend, now husband, Jeffrey, while I was living in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. He was an American who was there, who had been transferred there for work. And he ended up getting transferred to Jakarta, Indonesia. And in time, we came to see this as an opportunity for me to get well. So 
I finished off my work contract in Kuala Lumpur and then eventually I went to live with him in Indonesia. And we had decided that once I got there, I would use that time to focus on my health, to focus on getting well. It had ended up taking about two years of really focused work on myself, so longer than I thought it would, but I did get there. I got myself back up to 100%. I, I was very much just focused on my recovery, but I did take breaks from it. So I, you know, I'd go for a long stretch, maybe a few months or however long, and then we'd take a little holiday, or go do something fun. I mean, we actually did travel quite a bit while we were living in Indonesia, and that was part of what kept me going through my recovery time, through the intensity of those months of when I worked so hard. And the healing program that I put together for myself actually ended up making me feel worse. I could see that it was helping me get better, but it made me feel worse, so it made it even more difficult just to be in this bubble of healing, feeling sicker, but to have these vacations and these fun things to look forward to really helped a lot. And I know that I am very fortunate that I had that opportunity as a part of my journey. And I learned how to live a little in a more healthy way. So, you know, many of our vacations, I wouldn't drink alcohol at all. I would still eat healthy. I'd find juice bars, find fun, more active, outdoorsy, being in the sun type things to do. Initially, I put together a healing plan for myself and it it wasn't perfect how it started out. It was a bit of an iterative process where I had to keep going back and reevaluating and tweaking as I went. And I wouldn't want anyone watching, listening to any of the things that I'm about to share, because I'll share all with you right now exactly what I did. Uh, but if some of this doesn't fit for you or doesn't work for you, or you're like, I can't do that because I have this or that, I just, I would never want anyone to get discouraged. Because I know sometimes I would get discouraged hearing about things that worked for other people that just did not seem like they were going to be an option for me. And that's okay. I think that's part of the recovery process is learning to just seek out as much options and information as you can, and then knowing how to assess what is for you and what you just need to leave behind, what isn't meant for you, what, what, what doesn't make sense for you. So for me, if I were just to sum it up in a sentence or two, what it came down to, it was all about supporting my gut, healing my gut, supporting my body's own ability to heal. So our bodies, I've come to appreciate, are incredibly powerful and can heal a lot of things under the right conditions. So it was about creating those right conditions while doing things to actively build up strength in my body. And I did all of this with zero supplements after those, you know, my first round at trying to get well with thousands and thousands of dollars worth of supplements. When I finally did get well, I wasn't taking a single one, not a one. And when I came off those thousands and thousands of dollars of supplements, I came off them almost overnight when I left to go to Thailand, which is probably not advisable, but that's what I did. But I didn't notice a change. Nothing in my body changed. I didn't get worse. I didn't get better. It, it was like, they weren't doing anything at all. <laughs> of course, I don't know for sure that they weren't, and lots of other people find that supplements help them. I'm not saying that they're not helpful. I'm not saying that they don't potentially have value for other people. I'm just saying that for me, when I finally got well, supplements were not at all a part of that equation. All right, so let me plow through the things that I found uh, were necessary for me to get better. I had to learn to manage stress effectively, and this one sounds probably too simple and like it really doesn't have anything to do with things, but Managing stress was huge because stress I found could be more toxic than virtually anything else out there. So I had to really get good at managing my emotions, at keeping myself in a more calmed, relaxed state and to having strict boundaries around me so that people, things, places weren't yanking me around like a marionette doll, pulling me into all these different emotional spaces. I had to really protect my healing bubble and just keep myself as much as possible in this state of zen because that seemed to be when my body was most able to heal. And I've done a couple videos just on this topic itself if you'd like to check them out. I also had to get into a healing mindset which is such a massive thing. I could go on for hours just on this one and I actually have done uh, videos on this as well so I'll, I'll put some links to that but it was about boundaries on the content that I consumed, about the people that I interacted with, about just so many things. Um, but so yeah, that mindset was a really huge piece of it for me. 
sort of like the control center, you know, this needed to be good to help everything else uh, come together. And I had to do all of those healthy things in life that you associate with good health, things like drinking lots of water, getting lots of sun, removing toxic foods, cutting out alcohol, all that regular kind of stuff. That being said, my first go around, I went really nuts removing toxins from my life, making sure everything was non-toxic as far as I could manage. But living in Jakarta, I actually found this quite challenging to find natural body pro products, natural cleaning products. They have some of the worst air pollution there in the world. So every day, just breathing, I was pulling in so much toxins into my body and I still did manage to recover there so I think it's good to remove as much as we can it just makes sense right to bat, get the bad out and put some good in but if you can't control everything or you don't have the money to make all of those changes I don't know that it means that you're doomed at least it didn't for me for me I started out this end of a healing journey of mine on a, something resembling sort of a keto diet and I was seeing some progress but it didn't work great for me uh, and I, I made a switch to a whole food plant-based diet and for me that was a total game changer it really really helped me to thrive it helped me to start recovering more quickly from exercise and just all sorts of things on my body started functioning better again I've done videos on this as well if you'd like to check it out gluten is a big one that comes up and I've tried cutting gluten out repeatedly and it never seems to make a difference I cut it out I don't feel better I bring it back in I don't feel worse so I still eat gluten. I'm fine with it. Oddly for me, rice. Rice is hugely problematic. So it just goes to show that we really need to experiment and listen to our bodies and see what's right for us. I also did juice cleanses. So periods of time, this time I did them ranging anywhere from one to three days where I consumed nothing but low glycemic vegetable juice. And I also did intermittent fasting. So I had a uh, window during my day that I consumed food and then outside of that window I did not so it was anywhere from oh, I think it ranged from like a two to an eight hour window where I do intermittent fasting so an eight hour window might be I eat breakfast at 10 and I eat dinner by six and then I don't eat anything outside of those hours I just found that giving my body those breaks from solid food that break from the really taxing work of digest digesting and eliminating all the food that we're eating it gave it a chance to focus on other things like healing and cleansing. I've really come to appreciate how much energy it requires when we're constantly eating that our, our body, everything, all the energy gets diverted to that and dealing with that and it can't focus on other things. So for me, uh, various forms of fasting have been hugely beneficial. Another game changer for me was probiotics, but not probiotics in supplement form. I did those bottles and bottles and bottles and bottles, all different brands and kinds. Maybe I just never found the right brand but they never worked for me. But when I switched to getting my probiotics from food, from fermented foods like kimchi, kombucha, uh, kefir, fermented vegetables, all the different things, those are packed full of naturally occurring probiotics. So when I started incorporating that into my diet, it did wonders, wonders for healing my gut. I cannot state this enough. Another massive one for me was incorporating movement into my life. I realized that by laying still all day, I wasn't getting better. I needed to move for a couple of reasons, probably way more reasons that I even understand. But the ones that I came to appreciate were one is the lymphatic system. So just we need to move for our lymphatic system to move and our lymphatic system is a uh, responsible for all sorts of things. It's often called our body's garbage removal system. It's multi-organ. It, it, there's this fluid in our body that doesn't have a pump so it relies on different things for that fluid to get moving and one of them is us moving. So I needed to move throughout the day and I also found that I needed to slowly be building up strength and I had trouble with anything that brought my heart rate up too high so I stayed away from cardio completely. I did some walking, little bits, Oh, but not much. My focus was strength training and I started with just one or two minutes a day and I slowly built up from there just doing really gentle light body weight strength training and I've done quite a few videos on this so I can link those as well including a couple that show specifically what my workouts looked like at various stages of my recovery if you're interested in checking that out. And this piece of my recovery program is actually what made it 
really challenging for me. It, it seemed to be one of the things that showed me the most benefit, but it's also one of the things that made me feel worse because at least for the first six months, any kind of movement, any kind of exercise, no matter how small, always made me feel worse. I seemed to spend most of my time recovering from whatever little tiny, teeny bit of exercise I had just did, trying to get myself to feel better so I could do a teeny tiny bit more. But how much I could do was growing as the months passed. So whereas one minute used to make me feel sick, now I could do five minutes and that five minutes made me feel sick. But if I went back to one minute and just did one, I was fine. So I could see that I was getting stronger, but I had to keep pushing it. I had to keep raising it. And every time I raised it, I got back in that zone where it was making me sick again. But just seeing the progress that I was making showed me that I was getting stronger and it made me feel strongly that I was on the right track. I also had to learn ways to support my body while I was exercising so that my body would recover faster. I discovered that there were things that I could do that minimized my downtime and slowly minimized those bad feelings from the post-exertional malaise. And I've done videos on that as well if you'd like to check them out. And a part of this for me was stretching. Stretching was huge for me. With MECFS, I found that my body got incredibly tight and incredibly sore and I had to stretch all of the time. And when I started implementing this movement or exercise program, that tightness and that soreness for about the first six months at least got worse. And stretching was one of the things that I did to alleviate that. So I would stretch after my workouts i do air quotes because you know when it's only one or two minutes it seems strange calling it a workout but i did and then i stretched every single night before bed and sometimes i'd get up in the middle of the night and stretch again because it really helped me to manage my body pain and my body aches and i've done videos on stretching as well on a couple different types that i've done some that you can do from bed and some from a mat so i'll link those if you want to check them out and I'd mentioned the lymphatic system and supporting my lymphatic system ended up being a big part of what helped me to get well. So part of it was through the movement, you know, things like the exercise program and the stretching, but there were other things that I found that I could do to help my lymphatic system as well. Taking hot and cold showers. So every single shower I took, I alternated between hot and cold water during the shower and that with the vessels constricting and um, dilating gets things moving. So they helped me a lot. Their massages also helped me a ton. Living in Indonesia, massages were cheap and I had a place right across the street. So it was very convenient for me. So I could pop over and for just a few dollars, I was fortunate that I could get a full body massage. So I did that a lot. So massages helped me quite a bit. I went every week, I'd say sometimes multiple times a week. And when I talk about exercise and movement, it wasn't just that one or two minutes a day. Yes, I had that one or two minutes that I scheduled where I did a specific strength training program, some strength training activities, but it was about incorporating movement throughout my day. I couldn't just be laying down most of the day. So I had to find ways to gently incorporate movement into my day that didn't make me feel worse. And I did find some strategies and ways to do that. And I've done videos about it. So I'll link those as well. Another one, huge. Another one I think we take for granted is sleep. I had to make sleep my priority. My mantra was sleep at all costs. I did all sorts of things to ensure that I was sleeping better. And I've done a video specifically on all the things that I found to help me sleep. So I'll link that below. I also had to have a pain management system because although pain wasn't a massive part of my experience with MECFS, it did come out during my recovery more so than at other times. So the things like the stretching, sometimes taking painkillers, I found hot baths did me a world of good. I know this isn't suitable or appropriate for everybody, but for me, really hot baths help tons. I would even sometimes get up in the middle of the night just to take a hot bath because it was the only thing that relaxed and soothed my body and helped me to get back, back to sleep. You know, another one that I don't always mention, but it is a huge one I realize now looking back is that having love and support in my life was a big part of my recovery too. Because when I was trying to do it on my own, all those years on my own in Asia, and most of my focus wasn't on recovery, but every once in a while I would try, you know, I'd read a new book or something would get me fired up and I'd try, but it was just really hard on my own. And it's not to say that you can't do this by yourself or that you need to be in a relationship or married, but I think we need some sort of support, whether it's through friends, whether it's through family, whatever it is, whatever works for you. So finally having Jeffrey in my life made a world of difference and it was a huge factor. 
having that support helped me to stay on track even though I was still the one that had to do all the work it was still on me it just it was a game changer in terms of it fueling my recovery and the last one I'll just mention is pacing and this is one I hear people talk about a lot and I think it's with good reason because I think a lot of us get caught in that um, boom crash sort of cycle where we use every bit of energy we have and then plus a bunch that we don't have and then we set ourselves back so it's sort of one step forward two steps back and you're clearly never going to get out of anything at that pace so I had to learn how to pace myself which is like a super human almost ask because it's really tough it's a really tough thing to hold back um, but I eventually I never perfected it but I got a lot better at it and I've done a couple of videos specifically on that on the things that helped me and on I had a very specific strategy that I came up with uh, that I used for pacing that helped me a lot so I'll link those as well if you're interested in learning more about what worked for me for pacing I mean that that really kind of sums it up I'm sure I've missed some things in there but that is the gist of it and I imagine it all sounds fairly simple and straightforward and it is but none of it was easy I worked so hard it is impossible to exaggerate how hard I worked on all of this it was really really tough I really put my all into it it was grueling um, but worth it and doable and I could see throughout that time that I was getting better so even though it was tough and not so fun or exciting uh, just knowing that I was finally getting out of this was was all the motivation I needed to get going it was clear that it was working it wasn't just even just wishful thinking or being positive or having a good mindset it was like I can see it I can do more than I could a month ago six months ago a year ago and after about a year I was doing really well I say it took me two years to get better because I'm talking about getting back to full health but that second year I was doing really well already I mean I learned to surf in that second year and I was terrible at it it was grueling those waves were beating me up and it was exhausting but I, I could manage it and I was okay after so it was two years to get me fully back one year to get me to a place where I was pretty good I think I was already doing hour-long workouts strength training workouts uh, a year in so yeah yeah now life is good now I'm running six days a week I'm doing strength training workouts three to four times a week it's been interesting with COVID but I found some good home apps that help me with this I am really really thriving and I really feel fully past this I'm not perfect all the time and I don't always feel great and it is possible on some days there might be something that it is MECFS still popping its head up or it might just be a normal part of you know being in your 40s and being human I do struggle with that I expect perfection and anything less than that I start to chalk up as a return of MECFS symptoms when I think it's mostly probably not I haven't tried working full-time yet and I'm currently looking for a job so if you're hiring let me know <laughs> Uh, but that will be another test for me so we'll see how my body responds to full-time work once again but I feel good about it I really feel good oh I would tell you don't get sick in the first place <laughs> if you can avoid this please do I would say that no one person has the answers for you I certainly don't have all the answers for you and if anyone's claiming that they do run or take what you can from them and then cut your ties and go because nothing I've seen nothing I've read nothing no one I've talked to nothing has led me to believe that there is one way out of this whether it's diet or exercise or supplements or medications or or whatever you know you can follow what one person did to the letter and it won't work for you or it might make you worse it seems to be about just taking in as much as you can from different people different places being willing to experiment and making sure that you don't give up that willingness to not give up until you get to the place where you want to be and I would say don't try and just wait this out because I have not 
yet heard of a single person who just waited for this to go away and then it just went away on its own. It seems like we need to be actively working on things, many different things for it to get better. And I would say don't discount things because they sound too simple. You know, there's this emerging uh, medicine called lifestyle medicine that is we're coming to believe is profoundly fa uh, profoundly powerful things like diet and you know removing toxins and supporting your body and getting exercise and sunshine and water and happiness and love and connection and all these things can do so much more than we think they can i think most of us were brought up thinking that the answer needs to be surgery or some kind of new fancy drug that's come on the market but i, I don't know many people that that's been the answer for them. I, I'm not sure I know anyone that that's been the answer. And that also that lack of progress isn't failing because I think so many of us we're working so hard on this and we're, we feel like we're not getting anywhere and we're doing everything that that other person did and but I'm not better so sometimes for me it would feel like am I not doing it right? Am I not trying hard enough? What is it? Why isn't it working for me? I would feel like I was failing and, and it's just it's it's not it's just it's kind of a long journey of a lot of experimenting and those periods of lack of progress aren't failure it's just it's just part of this whole process it's for now anyways until we find something better until we understand it better it's just a part of the way out of this but there are times when you're just not making progress or it feels like you're going backwards but it doesn't it doesn't mean that you're not gonna you're not getting out of this there are a lot of unknowns and this journey out of here is a lesson in patience that is for sure. And I'd say, you know, find a healthy way to balance healing with living, living, whatever that is. Uh, but, you know, put the work in, but also take some breaks and just do some things that make you happy. And not to worry about those times when you're in the bubble. Sometimes it feels like we're missing out on so much, but it's all, it's not going anywhere. Uh, there's lots of time to do all those things. Just nothing is wasted. Time isn't wasted when you're spending time working on yourself and getting yourself healthy and happy. I've actually done a video on this question, just specifically all the things that I wish I knew when I first got sick, and I included in it a bunch of wisdom from quite a few other people who have also been sick with this illness and what they would go back and tell themselves. So if you'd like to see that, I will link that one below as well. And I'd also say get some support and be selective about where that support comes from. Find a group, find some people that fit for you. If it feels at all negative or toxic or just for whatever reason you can't put your finger on isn't working for you, then keep looking. Find something else. Myself and another wonderful gal named Annie actually have started a Facebook group that we would love for you to come join. It's called MECFS Recovery Support and Inspiration. So I'll put a link to that below. We'd love for you to come by and just say hello. So that's it for my story for today. I tried really hard to pull together the information from so many different videos that I've put out so you could have it all in one place and then also include some extra stuff that I, I haven't had anywhere. So it's been great spending this time with you and I've got more MECFS stories coming up. I've got more interviews lined up, some full recovery, some other unique experiences, plus a bunch of other videos. I've got so many videos in store. I am struggling actually, re feeling a bit stressed that I can't get them out fast enough. There aren't just enough hours in the week, but there's lots of great stuff coming. So if you haven't subscribed, please do so. And if you enjoyed this video, I'd love it if you could give it thumbs up and share it with your friends. Share it on social media. Let's share our resources, share the inspiration and help one another out. So thank you so much for watching. I love so much connecting with all of you here and so many of you have also connected with in other places like Instagram and Facebook and it's just so nice to have that opportunity to chat. So let's keep the conversation going. I'd love to hear your thoughts in, your, in the comments below. I'd love to hear if any of this resonates for you, if you've tried any of these things, if you have any other suggestions, share some things that have been working for you. Let's pool our knowledge. This is I think the best way for us to get out for people just to see what's working for other people and what's not so that they can have that information and judge for themselves and know what might be worth it for them to try and to have a little hope so let's be there for one another so i thank you for watching i thank you for commenting and i put out new videos every week and i hope to see you next week Bye.